At this time, we are transitioning into panel three, which is our academic academic partnership panel. I would like to introduce Dr. Ernest Bartholomew. He is the chief of the Division of Neurosurgery at Downstate Health Sciences University. Welcome, Dr. Bartholomew. Good afternoon, everyone. Oop. Okay. All right, so uh, I have the, uh, the distinction and the privilege of leading the panel that follows lunch. <laughs> um, so this morning, um, we heard from Dr. Morse in our keynote um, the importance of extending beyond the biological realm and our ability to understand um, the sources of our health disparities. She spoke to a framework that includes not only biological but behavioral, uh, societal and structural determinants of health, and of health, and she also spoke to uh, the historical determinants in her comments about colonialism and um, and the wealth disparities created by uh, legacies of colonialism. Um, and uh, subsequently, um, we had very dynamic panels. Uh, first, talking about engagement with uh, government um, and the political realm, uh, followed by a panel that looked at community engagement. So um, in this panel, uh, we will look at another sphere, academic, academic partnerships. Uh, and that can look a number of different ways. That can uh, be within an institution, whether, whether by cross-disciplinary or multidisciplinary work, interdepartmental partnerships. Um, and that can also be between institutions, um, Academic twinning is the term that we might use in the global health realm. I'm a global health researcher. Um, or multi-institutional partnerships. Um, and so um, in this panel, we'll look at the uh, relationships um, and uh, possibilities between um, academic, academic partnerships and our ability to advance the health equity agenda. So I'm going to invite our panelists uh, to the stage. and. Um, you can start thinking about this uh, opening question as you make your way up here, uh, which is uh, an invitation just to share from your own experience um, uh, about the role of academic academic partnerships uh, in advancing health equity research and the health equity agenda. So, um, so please come to the stage. And uh, I'll remind everyone that uh, detailed bios are available. Uh, for all of our speakers in our program document, and that's accessible via the QR code that you'll find in your uh, registration materials. So um, two of our panelists, and I'll ask you to raise your hands as I uh, call out your name, uh, are faculty members at Downstate School of Public Health. So we have Dr. Uh, Thomas Mackey, who is Chair and Tenured Associate Professor of Health Policy and Management. Um, and uh, we also have Dr. Marlene Camacho Rivera, who is Assistant Dean for Student Affairs and Assistant Professor of Community Health Sciences. Uh, we also have uh, three panelists who are, are our invited guests, including uh, Maria Contel, who's founding director of the Brooklyn College Cancer Center at Brooklyn College, um, and uh, Dr. Erica Phillips, who's Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine, and Jack Fishman, Associate Professor of Cancer Prevention in the Department of Medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine. And then joining us online, uh, we have Dr. Wendy Davis, who is Executive Director of Postpartum Support International. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> All right. So, um, in no particular, perhaps we'll start with Dr. Davis. Um, just some opening remarks and we'll have each of you uh, comment here. Uh, reflecting on your own experiences about uh, the link between academic, academic partnerships and advancing health equity research. I am the executive director of Postpartum Support International, which is actually a community-based organization. And the, just the fact alone that I'm on this panel, which is academic, academic relationships, is a result of equity, engagement, and access. Because as a national um, 
CBO, we are invited in in the beginning stages of research with my uh, wonderful colleague Tom Mackey there and other academic institutions, and he'll describe that more in answer to your question. But for me, as a person who comes at this first as a clinician, as a psychologist, then as an advocate, and for a couple decades now as um, the leader of a community-based organization, um, I can't, I've never had, we never would be able to have this opportunity to engage our members, individuals with lived experience, as well as professionals in this kind of research. So I'm, I'm just really honored to, to represent that here on this panel. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. Um, would anyone like to volunteer to go okay. next? Yeah. So my name is Maria Contel. I'm, um, I'm coming to this uh, forum in my role as uh, director of the Brooklyn College Cancer Center. So Brooklyn College is, um, is an undergraduate uh, college mostly, but we have some, we have master programs and also a consortia doctoral programs. So when we established the, the cancer center, I'm, I'm a basic scientist, I'm a chemist doing drug development, but it immediately uh, I understood that um, health equity, cancer disparities w were going to be a very strong component of what we would try to do for several reasons, because we already were uh, working um, to diversify the pipeline of biomedical researchers and future uh, health workers and, and doctors. And um, what we've been doing is collaborating uh, with different departments. We are several departments together, but we also collaborate with political science, with sociology, to understand the social determinants of health. And now we are strengthening the public health component and also collaborating with different institutions like Sanidad State, of course, uh, that has um, this component, but I think it's very important that the students, even when they don't even know their major, start hearing about uh, equity and, and the need for, for equity. So when they go in the careers, they can already have a certain strength. Thank you. We'll go straight down the line, Dr. Phillips. We'll go down the line. Um, and from my perspective, as it relates to the academic-academic relationships, I think the most important and key part is, um, I think there are many different avenues, uh, as we just heard, as it relates to pipelines and from students and trainees. Um, as a health services researcher, I think academic-academic partnerships are critical to the breadth of the types of work and proposals that you can um, collaborate on uh, that really reaches and spans the issues as it relates to health equity, because the major part about health equity from a healthcare standpoint is that healthcare is not the solution to health equity. Um, and so, being an academic um, uh, health services researcher, you know, my research title starts with health services, but it really is about looking at health from a more global um, perspective. And so, academic, academic partnerships as it relates to schools of public health, like strong schools, um, like SUNY Downstate, um, other institutions in terms of undergraduates, um, other disciplines are so key to making sure that we are looking at health equity from really a multi-level disciplinary standpoint because it's a multi-level issue. Um, and so I think that's the most important aspect as I see it as it relates to academic to academic partnerships is respecting and understanding understanding your strengths, but also respecting and understanding your weaknesses mm -hmm. um, and partnering with those who do have those strengths as it relates to addressing this issue if you're serious about <clears throat> addressing the issue. Uh, just touching upon what uh, Dr. Phillips just said, I think that um, reflecting on my own experiences as a social epidemiologist <coughs> and a health equity um, researcher and someone who has uh, lived experience, who comes with lived experiences and lived knowledge, um, with many of the uh, health outcomes that we're trying to tackle within public health and medicine. I think that academic to academic partnerships just give us another opportunity to be able to put into practice um, what we know about the science of health equity um, research, that diversity, equity, and inclusion makes us stronger. Um, it leads us to identify um, new approaches and to be able to design and implement and evaluate innovative solutions to being able to address these complex real world issues. And so 
just as my colleague was saying, recognizing that every community has its own assets and challenges. We as institutions also have unique strengths and, and, and assets and limitations that we bring to the table with respect to our partnerships. We also have unique ties to uh, various communities. And so when we bring ourselves as members of academic institutions into these partnerships to make sure that we're using our privilege and our power and our opportunity to also be able to um, bring in and center the voices of the uh, individuals within the communities that we're ultimately trying to, um, trying to impact. Great, thank you, Dr. Mohan. Dr. Mackey? Yeah, great. Pleasure to be here with everyone today. Um, and really a pleasure to have uh, Dr. Davis, Wendy Davis, with us from Postpartum Support International. I had asked if she could join this panel because I don't think you can advance um, health equity through academic and academic partnerships without having the community at the table as well. Um, I think health equity requires a foundation um, of working with uh, our community partners to set the agenda of what our work is and to help us do the work and then help us disseminate and translate it into the change that our systems require. Um, so I'm really grateful to have uh, Wendy with us today um, uh, because I think it's really important. And um, and I'll, I'll also say that you know when we do this work, there's a lot of uncertainty in the work that we do, um, particularly as we try to advance health equity. Um, our communities are incredibly diverse, um, and uh, as we think about how we handle that uncertainty, right? How we handle the reality that different communities have different needs, et cetera. Partnerships with multiple um, other academic institutions and with the community are critical for our scientific endeavor to answer questions to advance health equity. Um, and in our own work, we have collaborations with um, University of Massachusetts um, Chan Medical School, where there is a perinatal psychiatrist and her team with whom we work. Uh, we, uh, uh, I'm trained as a medical sociologist. I work with another colleague who's a perinatal social worker at University of Illinois Urbane-Champaign, uh, Drs. Nancy Byatt and, and, and uh, Karen Tabdina, respectively. Um, and uh, it's really critical that we each have a part to play because there are blind spots that we will otherwise bring to the work that we do. Also, the diversity of the, the team itself is critical. We come from different communities, represent different um, uh, perspectives that are critical to how we engage the science and the work that we do. But I, I just want to emphasize that as we think about academic, academic partnership to advance health equity, I think it's really important that we remember the community needs to be uh, at the table in this conversation. And so again, I'm, I'm grateful that we have uh, Wendy here with us to offer some perspective as she's been a, a partner with us in these academic to academic collaborations in our work. Thank you, Dr. Mackey. Um, thank you, everyone. Very, very important points. Um, not only about uh, uh, referring to Dr. Mackey's comments, um, the importance of engaging community, but also to remember, even as we treat each category of partnership, there are important um, areas of overlap, um, even across the three conversations. For instance, we are sitting in a, in a governmental institution as well as an academic institution, and, and uh, that brings uh, its own array of characteristics uh, to deal with. Um, and along those lines, I will ask uh, my next question, again, to all panelists, so we'll go back to you, Dr. Davis. Um, uh, what are some challenges of interdisciplinary collaborations in health equity research, and how might you approach overcoming them? I'll just say briefly, because I'm really enjoying hearing from the other panelists. I think the challenge inherent is, um, in a sense, we all are coming from different, uh, we speak different languages in how we do our work. And so the challenge would be a lack of understanding leading to a lack of um, space sharing and, and respect in how we see things, how, for example, I might bring in the experience, lived experience um, of help seekers, as we call them here at Postpartum Support International, or, or um, the, the nuances understanding mental health conditions. And if I'm deal, if I were to be dealing with academic um, representatives of academic institutions that really only understood and only cared to understand their language and their context, I would just shut down. And I have in other settings. I would leave. I would shut down. I would say, I see there is no space for me here. I might bring uh, someone from our Alliance for People of Color to the meeting, and if they were not introduced with respect and in, in a really engaged, they would shut down. They would perhaps not come back. 
And so the challenge is inherent. And I can tell you that every moment of respect and inclusion and listening, and then the compromise in research methods with lived experience and community voices matters so more than I can express. Every um, opportunity to either meet us and saying, okay, we, we had not thought of that before, but us to also meet what, what's a research method? <laughs> you know, how do we understand the need for that? And so um, that's really been my experience there. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Ms. Contel? Yes, uh, I think um, what um, the previous uh, speaker said is true. Um, in order to create the spaces uh, or, of partnership and collaboration, uh, one of the main challenges, I think, is time, for example, because it's not that people don't want to collaborate. It's usually, and especially in places with not many resources. So one way of overcoming this challenge is to come together. You need to have a shared vision of what do you want to do, set priorities, and also be equal partners. One of the things, at least, we have experienced, and in terms of with this research, certain institutions, what they want is the diversity component, mm -hmm. or this or that. So I think it's very important in order to overcome is having a, um, a very focused agenda, a shared vision, and a project, and, um, and basically respect for one another and understanding how much you can gain of uh, doing work as a team. Thank you, Dr. Conter. Dr. Phillips? Um, I think my statement kind of echoes both, but I think the biggest thing that comes to mind is you don't know what you don't know. Um, and so if we think about why people go into academics, they go into academics to go really deep into a particular area, right? And so we often live in the weeds, in all honesty, um, and when it comes to academics. And um, the point of health equity is you got to get out of the weeds, but you don't you don't know what you don't know. So if you don't know most of these other areas, if you stay continually in that space, you continue to be sort of in the weeds. Um, and so, you know, the greatest challenge is how do you um, interact um, in an interdisciplinary way, respecting the fact, again, that, you know, you may come with strengths, but you also have limitations. Um, and academics, um, academic centers, I think, are not organized in a way that, I'm trying to be politically correct, um, which is often hard for me. Um, <laughs> how do I phrase this? Um, they do not compensate time. It's about, you know, it's about quickness. It's about swiftness. Um, and relationships take time to build. But you're, you don't really afford your faculty often, um, or your staff for that matter, the time that it takes to build relationships. So you don't know what you don't know, and you're not afforded the time to build the relationships that it takes to get to, to get you out of the weeds. And I often find that to be the biggest challenge. Thank you. So I am going to um, build upon what uh, Dr. Phillips just mentioned and also um, just reflecting back on Dr. Morse's um, really wonderful keynote about thinking about structural drivers of, of, of health equity and thinking about structural drivers of um, partnerships and how we do and how we engage in health equity research. And so um, some of the challenges, um, we, we think a lot about challenges, external challenges. I don't think that we spend enough time thinking about structural um, uh, challenges and barriers within our own institutions to be able to think about how we, um, how we support and how we elevate this work. And so thinking about how um, community engaged research is valued, how it is supported, not just supported from a, oh, you know, that's great, you, you, did a, you did a great job, you got this grant, but really what are the physical resources, the infrastructure, the time, and the investment that's needed um, on behalf of the institution to really to help to cultivate these relationships and support this work. And so I think some of the challenges are within our own respective institutions that impede our ability to be able to engage in these partnerships, but then also thinking about about the um, structural barriers that we as academics put up um, between each other that impede our ability to be able to do this work. And I think we sometimes fall into this um, 
fallacy of funding scarcity, where in order for me to be able to do this work, I have to deny you as an academic the opportunity for you to be able to advance your own work, not realizing that it's an opportunity mm -hmm. for us to be able to leverage our collective strengths and our shared resources to be able to build academic social capital. Ac social capital is, a, is an asset that exists within communities. It exists within institutions as well and, and across institutions. And so giving us an opportunity, if we can help to dismantle some of those structures and some of those policies and social norms within, to be able to do that within our academic, within health equity research and practice. And so using that as an opportunity to build these partnerships to actually change the social norms mm -hmm. around how we elevate as a discipline and across our disciplines, the science and practice of health equity. So both challenges, but opportunities that I see there as well. Very good, thank you. Dr. Mack. Yeah, um, so this is, a, this is a great question. And um, when I think about um, uh, academic to academic partnership, one of the things that comes to mind to me is this no, there's a concept called cultural exchange that Larry Palenkis advances in implementation science, it's an area of my re research. And he talks about how in order to exchange, make meaningful exchanges, uh, what he calls cultural exchanges, one needs to think about um, both the information sharing and then also the, um, the behavior change, right? And that that happens through processes of negotiation and compromise. Um, and I think when we're doing the type of academic to academic collaborations that we're discussing, there's constant need, right? To think about what is the information sharing that's happening? What are the behavioral changes, right? Why collaborate if there aren't things you're going to do to reflect a meaningful partnership um, that aren't going to reflect um, negotiation and compromise um, across the research process. Um, uh, um, and I think, it, for me, it's a very useful way to think about the, the mechanisms, right, by, by which we might be able to facilitate meaningful academic-academic partnership is to build in systems. It's a challenge and an opportunity, right? The challenge is oftentimes there are what I call, or we like to call them the team, I think Wendy will agree, productive tension, right? Like, so there are tensions that come up because you are negotiating um, differences in perspective, which is where the learning is, stands to be made, right? It's, it's the benefit. But if there isn't systems in place to facilitate opening that, that box, right? Allowing for that space, as I think Wendy so eloquently said, right? Then, then you don't have the opportunity to benefit in the ways that are possible, I don't think, for the academic to academic partnerships. And, I, um, and I'll say that I think that, the, that those types of productive tensions relate to things around reflexivity on gatekeeping. And, mm -hmm. you know, they extend beyond just um, uh, the, the, the disciplinary place we may sit, but they certainly include that as well. Thank you. So reflecting on uh, um, these challenges, right? Um, we've heard about uh, the fear, uh, cultures of scarcity, um, uh, concern about uh, you know, what uh, academic uh, uh, deliverables belong to whom, et cetera. Um, what can institutions do to foster an environment that overcomes these challenges and facilitates and promotes collaboration in health equity research? Um, and anyone can take this to start. Uh, please feel free to, if you're inspired. I'm, I'm happy to, I'll give something like where all the folks are <laughs> for it. So we've, we've done a lot of work to facilitate um, transparency and accountability um, and uh, uh, particularly in, in terms of thinking through things like publication um, committees for our studies so that there are academic to academic and community collaborations happening. Um, we have a publication committee, which includes a member of the community as well as other academic institutions, and we have like a very written up protocol. I'm happy to share it with folks um, if they're interested in looking at what we've developed. But, but I think that there's a real need for transparency and accountability, that it's clear what your, what your approach is to facilitate the co collaborations. Um, and the other thing I'll say is just recognizing that incentives are different for different folks that are in a part of the collaboration um, and being transparent about what one is incentivized by, right? Like it just own, like, you know, coming to the table with what is, what is it that I'm looking for from this um, and what do I need to achieve from this collaboration? And, um, and for some folks that may be the publications, but for others it's very different, right? Um, uh, uh, certainly, I know in our conversations with, with um, PSI, with Dr. Davis and her colleagues, 
publications, they're actually surprised that she's recently reminded me. They matter, like, you know, like they matter to her, but, but I don't think that they're necessarily driving the day in the way that for our junior colleagues on the team, um, it's, it, it's necessary, right? Like they have to come out of the collaboration with those publications um, for their career and their success. And so, um, so I guess the two points that I just make is um, one, transparency about incentives and about what's making folks um, tick what, while either in the collaboration, what are they working towards? And then um, also um, accountability and transparency with respect to systems and processes that can allow for things like um, that where, where there is shared incentive like publications. I think it's an interesting play on words because when I really think about it, most of these collaborations are not necessarily academics to academics. It's individuals within an yeah. academic center who are going out of their way to collaborate with others. Um, I can't say that my own institution has gone out of their way to say that SUNY Brooklyn is their partner. Mm -hmm. Let's just be real. Mm -hmm. um, and, but respectfully, I think there are individuals like myself who 100% know that my colleagues here are my partners and the people that I want to work with. And so I say colleague, but really friend. Um, and so I think um, a little bit of a difference in terms of thinking about, you know, what are the challenges? What are the challenges to really elevating and saying to an entire institution, what are you as an institution really doing to, um, to share in what's considered this scarcity, because at the end of the day, they're all looking at, sorry, I'm just not gonna be the politically correct statement, but when we, when we think about why academics do, some of the academic centers do what they do, it is about dollars, it is about indirects, it is about um, sometimes what are the resources, and so it's seen as if I am collaborating, I am now spreading those resources as though there is a substantial scarcity of it. And so I would love for us to finally get to the point where we are truly having a academic um, institution to academic institution partnership conversation, but I do still think we are really at the level of individuals within those institutions who are committed to health equity working with other individuals in other institutions, and we're not yet there as it relates to true academic to academic partnerships yet. Mm. I think, I think in order to foster um, academic institutions really need to make an effort and, and provide uh, an space again with, uh, with other academics from different institutions. At least this is what we did in, in, in our center. We, we tried to do institutional collaborations before we did um, the individual collaborations. Right. But I think you really need to have a common goal and, and in this case for health equity, I think it goes, I know there are not many resources, but because the goal is uh, such passion for so many people and so needed from the community, that is a driver. So provided there is uh, that shared vision, I think you can, and some space, some time uh, where you can talk uh, and be very transparent about what you bring, what you get, what the other person gets. Um, I have a little faith on some of this. Thank you. So I actually, um, this question is for Dr. Camacho Rivera. It's building on this and it comes from Dr. Phillips' comments and I'm thinking about um, the way in which um, the DEI space has become increasingly politicized, is under attack. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so looking at uh, some of the, the structural aspects of, um, of that form of institutional, let's call it, discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, what ways forward do you see for dealing, um, for dealing with DEI-related challenges? Yeah, I, um, I've, this is my third conference this week, and it's funny that this has all come up in, in various disciplines um, and in different, in different spaces. And so I think um, for those of us um, who went into um, uh, academia, whether it's medicine, whether it's public health, whether it's any other health professional discipline, we came in because we were really passionate about improving health and well-being um, of individuals within communities and, 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 and really thinking about, again, uplifting communities sustainably, equitably, um, through thinking about more, again, structural change 
and um, social change through community um, empowerment. And so for us, that work is going to continue regardless of whether words get taken away, whether um, you know one word has to be substituted for uh, a, a different word. And so I think what academic to academic and academic to community to academic partnerships allows us to do is to be able to um, uh, find collective power and collective um, uh, strength, again, in using our voices to be able to amplify why um, an a, a attack on DEI, an attack on engagement, an attack on anti-racism is, 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 is really pushing us back with respect to advancing the science and, and, and the practice of, of, of health. And so I think that it gives us spaces to be able to allow us safe spaces, to be able to allow us to share um, our fears, our um, frustrations, but um, to be able to do that in concert with people who are um, going to be there to support you and lift you up and be able to help you accomplish the work that you need to do within your, within your own institution, but also um, within community. And so I think that, um, that these types of partnerships play very important roles because oftentimes, again, as you know, Dr. Phillips mentioned, it's individuals who are cultivating and sustaining these relationships on behalf of the institution. So even if the institution decides to pivot or um, you know change policies or change language, that doesn't stop you as an individual from holding you know and moving forward the work that you ultimately that that you ultimately value. So it gives us a sense of of, of again collective strength solidarity, a space for us to just be able to also think about um, solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, different institutions operate very differently with respect to policies and practices. And so knowing the, own, the norms and policies and practices of your own institution allow you to be able to share that knowledge with your colleague to be able to um, help to um, figure out how you navigate those challenges currently. But again, um, Everybody always wants to know what the next institution is doing. Oh you're, what, oh, you're doing this for health equity, you're doing this in training, you're doing this for DEI. I'm going to take that back to my leadership and say, well, this is what Downstate is doing. This is what Cornell is doing. This is what Brooklyn College, what UMass, what other organizations nationally are doing. And if we just had the opportunity to not, um, you know, uh, live in fear of what is, is what, but really double down and push back on the work that we know that needs to be accomplished. I think that that gives us, you know, again, some collective strength and being able to realize that, you know, we're, 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 we're stronger when we work together, especially on these policies and states and bans that are coming for every single one of us, regardless of whether you're currently doing the work now or whatever state or institution that you're in. Just want to quickly piggyback on that because I think this is where the academic academic partnership definitely does have opportunities, um, opportunities to be a safe place um, when you, as an academic person, may be feeling under attack under attack in your own institution um, for, especially related to what we see, you know, every other day, another article in another state um, that's turning back the times. Uh, the conference that we were just mutually at, very openly one of the things that was shared was one institution sharing that they went actually out of their space to find attorneys external to their institution who do this work. Because one of the things that's happening is that most academic attorneys are there to obviously protect everyone. That is their job. We get that. Um, but just like as a general internist, I wouldn't perform surgery on, some, surgery on someone, not every attorney who is counsel at an institution actually has been in the space of this work and is their specialty. So how do you begin to actually identify those attorneys who are specialists in this area, who know how to work around the space, because that's what's really needed um, for academic institutions to not be under attack and but be able to be able to move in a safe space. And so at this conference, one institution who was able to have done that shared with another institution how you approach it, down to like literally here's the card of the attorney that we're using. Um, and so I think that's in particular as it relates to the time that we're in, that's going to become pivotal to institutions being able to stay in this space and work in this space. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. 
Um, so I have one more question. I'll ask all of the panelists before I open it up for questions from the audience. So we'll start with Wendy Davis. Uh, how can junior researchers and trainees be encouraged to engage in collaborative health equity research projects? I'll be brief because I have to jump off to a meeting, but I just want to thank the panelists for identifying I'm um, putting into words what I have been feeling um, during this panel as it is in the relationships and whether or not our institutions support um, the work directly, whether we're under attack externally, it is the relationships. And so I would just say to junior faculty, listen, <laughs> listen to these wise people and um, find those relationships, be those relationships, uh, because that is where the work is happening and it will continue to. And I am just really honored and, and um, humbled to be included in that. Thank you so much and thank you for joining us. I, am, I will speak here as a former chair. I think one very relevant thing, at least for junior faculty, is to provide reassign time and certain, I mean, any type of seed grant, and, and also, again, and, and a space where they can talk to other people. And I guess in health equity, of course, where the community is present, so they can, all these, um, let's say, uh, newer people and trainees can hear from the needs of the community, like different projects, and then feel passionate about something. If you are not passionate, if you are just, oh, you are junior faculty and come to my project because it's very cool, you need a little bit of ownership. But you also need some resources. So our responsibility as academics is, is to help the, the trainees. Thank you. Nothing to add to that. I think the chair said it well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think, again, just recognizing the fact that um, that junior faculty, that students um, come with knowledge, they come with unique skill sets that they are bringing to this team. And so it is a privilege to be able to work with them and incorporate them into um, these research and partnerships to be able to advance, to be able to advance the work forward. And so I think, you know, just <coughs> being, being mindful of that but also recognizing the, the power dynamics and the power differentials that do exist. And so figuring out ways to be able to establish um, research environments that are inclusive across career pipelines, but also, again, diverse perspectives, recognizing the opportunities for peer to near peer. I consider myself a near peer mentor. I am still an assistant professor. And so, um, but the opportunity to be able to bring more people into this work. Um, whether it's junior faculty or students, because again, these are complex problems that we're trying to tackle. We need all perspectives. We need everybody at the table, whether you think you're a health equity researcher currently or are uh, soon to become one. And so I think it's important to be able to cultivate those environments, recognize assets that everybody, um, that, that everybody brings, and to be able to um, implement practices within health equity research projects to be able to help to, um, you know, uh, uh, to be able to dismantle some of those power imbalances and other barriers. Thank you. We've spoken a bit about just the value of interdisciplinary um, research uh, as, a, as a goal often of academic, academic um, partnerships. I think the same can be said for mentorship um, as you pursue your own careers um, as junior faculty, really thinking about ways to create a mentorship team that leverages different disciplinary expertises to be of service you know, to you and your development. Um, is, is really valuable. And, I, and I'll just add to that community mentorship, right? Like folks that are not actually a part of the academy that may actually offer really insightful mentorship mm -hmm. to you about um, how to understand the needs of the community, et cetera, how to work with the community in research projects in ways that can create sustainable and lasting relationships for you in your career um, and, and that leverage their expertise in ways appropriate given their expertise that they have to offer. Um, and so just to really think through um, who that team is to support your work to advance health equity. And I think, um, and it, again, it may transcend just the academy. I think it often, in its best, it will. Um, uh, and the only other thing that I'll, that I'll say is just, um, I really want to uh, emphasize um, uh, the opportunities that can exist to do uh, fellowship programs that are, that can connect you to other junior faculty and mentors and in other institutions. So if we're talking about academic, academic partnerships, one of the critical moments in my 
career uh, was going to this, uh, this group called the Implementation Research Institute, or IRI at, at Wash U, um, where it was a, an intensive, like, uh, week-long program where I was with other junior faculty and mentors from across the country, of which I still have many relationships with and continue to work with, and so that was a real touch point for me in generating academic to academic to community partnerships um, in the work that I do and how I think about the work. So um, d definitely would just also put a plug in for these opportunities that can allow you to expand your network beyond your own institution. Thank you so much. Um, we have time for maybe one, <laughs> one question from the audience, and I see a hand raised. Over there, Dr. Straker. Mm -hmm. Hey there. So, I guess um, a question as a student, um, as we talk about these things and kind of breaking down the walls to the silos um, within our own. Um, areas of expertise or areas that we're exploring um, and trying to bring in communities into those spaces and talking with them is what are maybe some ways or resources to engage um, people who are trying to explore a new area um, in a way that's maybe a little more um, accessible um, outside of the true research um, and research articles, whether it be maybe newsletters or books that might be a little bit more appropriate for just that um, initial exploration of those topics. I'm a believer in getting out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And rather than identifying a book or an article, sit with an organization that's doing work in that space. Um, I'll just use myself for an example. I remember um, my first year after finishing my training, um, not clinical training, my research training, um, I did something very unusual um, for, I think, a junior faculty member uh, in a medical center. Is like I literally went, I, I went out of my way to get away from the building, like as much as I possibly could, um, and sat in the spaces of organizations in terms of their work. Sometimes just going to meetings and sitting there listening, um, being silent, just being just taking things in to understand what the conversations were, to understand what communities needed. Um, it probably took me a year to actually raise my hand to ask a question or even say anything because it wasn't about me or it was really about me understanding. And so I think articles and books are great, but lived experiences are far more important. And so put yourself in the space to hear those lived experiences rather than reading about them. I would definitely agree with that. I think that um, beyond, um, in addition to just sitting and, and listening, I think volunteering your time um, to actually be able to uh, become engaged within community or in partnership with communities that you're really passionate about. And so um, I have been, um, you know, my first um, entree into public health was really through environmental justice. And I was really passionate about environmental justice. Again, looking at the very obvious injustices within my own community, with the air that I breathe, the housing that we live in. And so had an opportunity to just volunteer my time actually with um, the Boston Public Health Commission and um, going through their healthy housing program and volunteering my time to learn how to become an asthma advocate and go out into public housing sites. Uh, that led to working with environmental justice organizations within Boston, which continued to lead to my, some of my volunteer work here in, uh, with environmental justice organizations here in New York City with We Act uh, for Environmental Justice as well as the Urban Design Forum that's here within New York City. And so that has taken, that's about a 20 year span of, 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 of work that I've con it, it been able to um, uh, practice that I've been able to integrate for my own self-growth, for my own knowledge, but also, again, just continuing to um, re remain um, in involved and giving back and really feeling like I am a part of my community and I can utilize some of the resources that I've brought within, that I've learned within these institutions for, you know, real change. And um, I think that being flexible with what we think about with the term research um, research without translation into practice, without translation into action, for me is not research worth doing. And so what you'll see is that if you think uh, beyond 
you know, what you consider to be the, the confines or the, the definitions of, of, of research, colonial definitions of, that of, of research, you'll find that many of these organizations are doing active, meaningful work that is very much in the spirit of what you're trying to accomplish as a public health professional. If, if I may add, because <clears throat> what you both said, um, you also, in addition to communities, you also can look into professional societies, mm -hmm. which uh, are places for training, are places to, that you can also volunteer time to fund mentors, uh, mentors outside of your expertise, and also go outside of your expertise in research by looking into other researchers. They may be close, they may be far. You've read something, you know. It's, it's very good to go out of your comfort zone, travel, and, but in person, I mean, mm -hmm. mostly. I would say life experiences are very important. Dr. Bartholomew? Yes. We have one question here. Sure. Thank you. Uh, really great panel. Um, just, I guess, to wrap up, uh, especially thinking about the future and like the current climate we're in. Um, one thing that I feel like is like the most crucial is um, the issue of just the pipeline of future researchers and medical professionals and all of that getting bottlenecked uh, because of the fact that these protections are going away um, and under threat. And I think the most worrisome part of that is just like the fear and hopelessness in a lot of youth and students right now. Um, so I guess what would you say um, is a next step or a, a goal to ensure that you know people continue on in this field and know that this is you know this is a safe space for them to to continue in and they do belong and should uh, continue, especially with barriers that they might face um, in terms of equity. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think that we would be doing this work if we didn't believe in the audacity of hope. And so I think that we all hear um, recognize the challenges. It's not seeing things through rose-colored glasses, but again, recognizing the fact that we need to um, continue to build solidarity and strengthen our partnerships to be able to identify um, new ways and expand ways to be able to continue to do this work. And so um, the partnerships will continue, pipeline programs will continue, um, find new ways to be able to, again, go outside of our institutions to be able to engage um, uh, students and the next generation of you know, physicians and public health practitioners and scientists who are committed to translational research for equity to continue to do this, uh, to, to continue to do this work. And so I think that um, you know, just, just um, recognizing that there are people, the people that you see who are out there in the community, we talked about being out there and being visible in the community, are going to continue um, with greater resolve to do this work. We know that that responsibility, that privilege really does fall on us to be able to continue to train, especially, you know, here at, at Downstate, at Cornell, at Brooklyn College, you know, um, all, all of our, uh, our, our, our future colleagues. And so, um, providing us with some additional perspective so that we can hear and understand and listen to what your fears, what your concerns and challenges are, and to be able to work together to identify strategies to be able to bring, uh, continue to bring more folks to the table. So. I'll add something to that. Um, I, I mentor um, public health trainees in a public health leadership program at another institution, and one of them came to me with a similar question. Um, and, uh, and it was along the lines of being uh, intimidated uh, about the, uh, this, the very prestigious structure surrounding this trainee um, and, uh, and the discouragement the trainee was feeling, um, facing. Um, you know, it may have been something similar to the kind of imposter syndrome thing some of us have, have heard about, right? And so my advice was to inquire into why the student was in the program in the first place, and, um, and the student shared with me um, a very personal story about a mother and a child in, in Uganda and the uh, challenges that that mother and child and their community were facing. 
And so I asked the trainee, is this prestigious institution that you're in bigger than this community that you're here to learn to serve? And very quickly, the response came, absolutely not. And so I asserted the importance of remembering why you're doing this and living for something bigger than yourself. And I promise you'll find all of the inspiration you need to keep moving forward if you stay focused on why you're doing this. It's much bigger than you and, and it's to, um, to have an impact on something that will likely outlive you. And I think that'll, that'll empower you to deal with anything coming your way. Okay. So I, why don't we give our um, panelists a round of applause. And, um, and I guess I'll invite Dr. Salafu to come give closing remarks. So, yep, thank you. <laughs>
And then finally, I really want to thank um, the university for the support. Uh, this university is just amazing. Uh, we have a senior vice president for research who is really, really behind health equity research. Uh, and I think in the future, we're actually going to expand beyond what we're doing in terms of funding. Uh, you may have heard a little bit of the news, you know, SUNY Downstate, quote unquote, closing. Don't buy into all those things. It's all politics. We don't want to get involved with that. All right. This institution is going nowhere. We are here. Uh, and in the end, it might actually turn out to be a good thing because a lot of funding is going to come to support health equity research. Uh, we actually have heard news that part of the plan is to promote a health equity environment. Uh, part of the plan for the transfer program is actually to evolve into what we call the Brooklyn Health Equity Institute. And we are hoping that some funding will actually come to expand that piece where we can now go from these kinds of conversations to now actions, right? We can have programs that are now solely focused on actionable items in the community. Uh, so that is the future that we're looking for. So thank you all and um, we'll see you next year. Okay. Unless somebody wants to continue, we will stay. <laughs>